Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In the last seven days, we've had three different launches that have had unfortunate interactions with range safety. Now, obviously, Starship Flight 7 was the big one, where the upper stage Starship uh, had an engine problem and subsequently broke apart and dumped debris all over the Atlantic, leading to air traffic controllers frantically having to put aircraft into holds to keep them out of potential hazard regions. But... The day before, we had Blue Origin with New Glenn on the launch pad counting down and suddenly a wayward boat was sighted in the range area. They had to reset the counter again and uh, they did eventually launch. And finally, yesterday, a Starlink launch at Vandenberg was counting down and it scrubbed at the last minute because of a, an aircraft in the range. So I thought it might be interesting to actually talk about these controlled areas that are used. Uh, you might have heard them called NOTAMs or TFRs, maybe even AHAs or DRAs. And as you can imagine, they look like areas on a map that are defined by latitude and longitude and time when they become active. And their primary, primary audience is people that operate aircraft or operate boats. So there's actually two different agencies involved. One is generating the, the NOTAMs, the Notice to Air Missions. Those are obviously concerned with things in the sky. And there's the maritime equivalent, the Notice to Mariners, which will include navigational warnings where things might end up landing in the sea. But as space nerds interested in rocket launches, we are also interested in them because they have to appear a few days ahead so we get a warning of when a launch might be. And furthermore, by looking at the areas on a map, we can figure out the launch azimuth, the direction it's going, by measuring how far uh, downrange the booster is coming down, we can get an estimate of the performance. And while I am primarily talking about the TFRs, the navigation warnings, understand that NOTAMs, which I deal with, can contain all sorts of information. They can tell you that runways are closed at certain airports or that instrument landing systems are unavailable. They can tell you that there's possible GPS jamming in a region. And uh, there's a common one that comes through that just says, hey, by the way, remember, G5 cell phone connectivity is probably going to mess with your old school radar altimeters. And in the raw form that they're distributed, they're incredibly terse uh, pieces of text with all sorts of weird acronyms and coding. And this is why most people actually consume these notices through apps like ForeFlight, which will do a lot of the processing and lay the stuff out on the map for them so they don't have to decode this and uh, you know, map it to a real world. And this is an example of a NOTAM that has a TFR for a SpaceX launch. So it starts out with CAR, a Central Air uh, Altitude Reservation Facility, uh, ZLA, so that's like LA Airspace, S SpaceX Starlink G11 25-3, Area A Stationary Altitude Reservation with an area defined as whole bunch of longitude and latitudes, and it says surface to unlimited, and it gives you the times when this happens. Now, if you put that on a map, this is what it looks like. And yeah, the airspace reservation is the light green area that I've highlighted. The darker green area underneath it, that is the maritime version. And you'll notice that that extends a little bit further out. I guess they're operating under different rules. So yeah, this goes out to the air pilots. They're supposed to know about this. It goes out to the air traffic controllers who are going to have to route around it. And it also goes out to like the dispatchers who actually plan the flights for the airlines since they're going to have to figure out how much fuel aircraft need for this diversion. Now, if we project this onto a map along with air traffic showing uh, tracking ADSB data, that is the aircraft are broadcasting their position. So initially this airspace isn't hot. I think it'll go live around 1500 because that was you know, like half an hour before the launch was supposed to happen. But you see the aircraft are coming over the Pacific into LA and various airports around that region. And they're mostly just flying straight through that. But as we get closer to the time, you're going to notice that the airliners will start getting routed north and south around this. And I should make it clear that all the big airliners will be flying under instrument flight rules, which means while there's pilots up there steering them, the air traffic controllers are telling them exactly where to go. The pilots don't have a say unless there is an emergency. If they deviate, that is potentially a problem. Anyway, the airspace is hot. It's now like 30 minutes to the launch, and you see one green plane flying through, but most of the other ones are being routed either side. This was the time the launch was supposed to happen, and it didn't. I don't see anyone in that airspace. I did see that one plane flying through about 10 minutes before. 
But, you know, it's not the air traffic controllers that make the decision, it's the range safety officer who would have to pull the trigger. Now again, the airspace is now opened up and aircraft are once again flying through it. And so given this information, it's really hard to tell whether any of these airliners were responsible. There was, there's like four real candidates and it's not clear that any of them really qualify. There's Delta 480, that was north of the airspace. ATC was talking to them, they were expecting to see the launch. There's Hawaiian Airlines 35, which wouldn't have passed through the airspace, but would have passed over the marine warning area during the launch time. Southwest 1131 also passed through that same area. And the one that actually flew through the airspace was Hawaiian Airlines 1, but it flew through several minutes before the actual T0. And so it would have been well clear of the airspace when the launch happened. But it's entirely possible that the aircraft that caused the violation just isn't in this data. This is ADSB data, it's broadcast by almost every single aircraft. But if it's a very small ultralight, it may not have it. Uh, drones won't have it. And, you know, there's all sorts of things that could have potentially been in there. Maybe there was someone flying a powered parachute along the coast and they didn't realize they were blundering into an area and somebody on the ground alerted the range control officer. It's also possible there was something in the downrange recovery area, and according to ADSB data, we didn't see anything down there, but again, maybe it's something we couldn't see. So now, let's uh, talk about Starship IFT-7, because this actually is a great example of how the FAA's air traffic control system has adapted to handle launches in a way that is less disruptive, allows more launches and more airliners. So yeah, Obviously, this you know failed, it had an RUD, and it began breaking up and falling apart, falling into the ocean to the east of uh, the Caribbean. So now, again, we can look at the hazard maps. And I should pause for a second, by the way, and say these maps on Google Maps are by someone called Raul. He has compiled, like, all of the SpaceX launch stuff, and it's an amazing resource. Mad props for Raul. You know, check him out, follow him, whatever, give him some money. But yeah, this is the these are the hazard zones that were officially announced. The notice to mariners and notice to airmen. And the yellow one that extends a long way across, that is the maritime warning. The green one, the aviation, the airspace warning, it stops before it gets to even Florida. But now if we zoom out and we look at the area where the debris fell near the Turks and Caicos Islands, there was nothing marked on there. There was nothing announced ahead of time. So how did the air traffic controllers know what to do? Well, you probably won't be surprised to know that there was in fact a plan which included the debris areas downrange. And so while this information was available to air traffic controllers, as far as I can tell, like dispatchers and pilots, they aren't necessarily aware of this because it's not part of the NOTAM system. And that's partly because it's not actually part of like international air traffic control standards. So this map comes from an FAA document about the flight. And I didn't download it from any FAA website, I downloaded it from a South American air traffic control website that distributes data to their controllers. But you can see here, on the left, we have these areas that are marked in red that are very similar to the TFRs, but as you go out to the east, there's these yellow areas that are labeled DRA. So AHAs are aircraft hazard areas, DRAs are debris response areas. And the difference being the aircraft hazard areas always kick in there. The TFRs are not supposed to fly through those, but the DRAs, the debris response areas, those only turn on if there is a problem. And by the way, if you're wondering why there's a gap between DRA-3 that's south of Florida and DRA-4 that's further east, it's not because of any physics of the launch system. It's entirely because the jurisdiction changes in that region. So this is a replay of the air traffic in that region around the time that Starship launches. And you see initially aircraft are flying through that area and then suddenly they all get routed out of that area. And you see aircraft on both sides basically flying in, in circles, waiting for them to be cleared so that they can actually pass through the area. And you might have heard that multiple aircraft declared emergencies with traffic controllers. And, you know, you might think that this is overly dramatic, but this actually stems from federal regulations. And I know that a lot of people are not necessarily fans of FAA regulations, but I am a fan of one particular regulation that basically says that if you declare an emergency, you can ignore all the other regulations until you've solved the emergency. And that's a really good principle to work from. So under the rules, aircraft that were basically flying in circles and their final clearance time was going to put them deep into their minimum fuel reserves, 
they declared emergencies so that they could enter into this airspace and accept whatever that risk was, understanding that the risk of running out of fuel was possibly the bigger risk. And you might wonder what the risk is. Well, according to the, the documentation, uh, the limits of the hazard area are defined by when the hazard drops to 1 in 10 million. And that may seem low, but you remember that closer to the centre of this, the hazard may well be a lot higher. Obviously, if you are directly lined up with something, the hazard is 1 to 1. Uh, incidentally, when the Space Shuttle Columbia broke up over the US, I believe the Columbia Accident Investigation Board found that the chances of the debris hitting an aircraft was something like 1 in 100. I mean, and that's divided over all the different aircraft in the airspace. So, you know, this is a very conservative estimate, but, you know, you have very high uh, consequence if something does happen. But back to those aircraft having to declare emergencies potentially for fuel, I saw a bunch of people saying, well, that's stupid of the pilots for, you know, flying across the Atlantic and not knowing this area is going to be here. Well, as I said, I uh, showed this diagram to a bunch of people that work in airplane aircraft dispatch, the people that are making these flight plans, and they didn't have this. So yeah, perhaps these DRAs should perhaps be, uh, you know, shared a little more publicly instead of people having to go to, you know, an air traffic control website in South America. Now, as I understand it, the, the DRAs are a sort of a result of FAA redesign of policies regarding spaceflight so that they can be more responsive. If you think about it, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when the first SpaceX flights went up, they were closing down airspace over very large parts of the Atlantic, potentially for a long time. And that was obviously causing a lot of airliners to you know, have to accommodate for this. This is from the very first Falcon 9 launch, and you can see that it goes almost all the way to Bermuda. So essentially, FAA's plan was they would shrink this down and then have these contingency areas that could be activated. And then also, there would be people that were in charge of real-time monitoring of space launches so that they could know when to make these areas hot, when to turn them off, and when to activate the contingency areas. And so if you look at a comparable launch these days, the green area close to the coast is pretty small compared to what we used to have. And yeah, you have a larger sort of landing area out in the Pacific for the drone ship because you do have a booster coming down and it's a fairly energetic event. And yeah, this shows that in the last 10 years or so, the you know the National Air Traffic Control System has understood that there will be an expansion in the number of space flights and they needed to adapt their control methodologies to make sure that they could handle this. And so yeah, let, we're left with New Glenn and I would love to say that I had a lot to say on this, but I, I don't actually sail boats very often. And when I do, I let other people do it. So I don't actually know very much. I, I do know that the the navigation warnings, they come down in almost the same format. They're a text document that gives you a series of latitude and longitudes, and they'll tell you when the section is active. But I, I don't think that in most of the ocean, there's an equivalent of air traffic control telling you, you know, that you need to clear the area. As I understand it, wayward boats are often chased off by range control aircraft that buzz them. And you know, you would think that captains of vessels that are operating out of ports near to launch facilities would understand that they should probably check the navigation warnings. But it was only a few years ago we had a massive cruise ship sailing out of Port Canaveral and scrubbing a launch. But at the other end of the scale, I've totally heard about people like uh, swimming or in kayaks getting ha having to get chased out of these controlled areas. So it doesn't matter what you're doing, they can't launch if there's humans in the area. So if you're ever doing anything in the vicinity of a potential rocket launch, check out this stuff, make sure that you're not the one causing a range scruff, and of course, I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.